Hello, it's Paul from Mode70 here, and uh, this week Matt Lee made a really interesting video called Can We Keep Politics Out of Gaming? And his conclusion was, correctly, no we can't, uh, but he does go into a lot more detail than that. I really recommend watching that video, perhaps before you watch this, um, and then coming back here. So I definitely agree with Matt about almost everything he says, and I think this is a fantastic video, it's very well presented, and it's a good example of the kind of... Um, fusion between popular and academic criticism that I think games really needs. So some of the key points that he makes that I really like are the fact that you can't eliminate political, social and cultural implicit influences from either the creation of art or how you perceive it. He says you can't separate out your worldview, which is shaped by your own experiences, so everything is going to be viewed through that personal subjective prism. People have a baseline of normality, and anything that deviates from that uh, is going to be challenging. He has a good graph with wobbly lines to illustrate this. That's very much true, and I think certainly the internet, particularly social media, has been really changing what people view as normal very quickly in recent years. That pace of change is accelerating, um, and that's definitely a good thing. But in the context of discussing stuff on the internet, we have to remember that people are coming from all of these different positions, so if we're inviting people to approach games critically, then there's going to be all kinds of positions and difficulties to deal with there, so a good recognition of that. Um, there's also a big tension between what people want from art and what they want from entertainment, which was something I talked about before, so again, good to see this discussed. So what I want to really kind of extract from Matt's video and talk about is the idea of contextual criticism. So here is a clip of Matt basically in one sentence summing up what contextual criticism is. The thing you've got to understand is each and every mechanic in every game you play is a reflection of the environment in which they were created, they're a reflection of the world. When I was at school uh, and I studied English literature, we talked about things in terms of themes, and this was very popular at the time. So if you were studying Hamlet, you might do the theme of revenge, and you'd go through looking at, through Hamlet, looking for quotes, looking for scenes like Hamlet kind of thinking about killing his uncle in the chapel and all of that stuff. And you'd write sentences like, here the author deals with the theme of revenge uh, with the use of dramatic irony as Hamlet is both driven by and so on. So you would attribute all of this to the author, which is which is one thing um, that Matt's talking about with the explicit and impl implicit division. Um, and also you would talk about these grand human traits. Criticism moved really far away from that. We had the, the, the death of the author was a kind of famous uh, post-structuralist idea. And then also you had all of this historical contextual stuff come in. So if you study GCSE English now, you'll be studying sort of bits of 16th and 17th century history when you do Shakespeare. So you'll talk about the English court and you'll talk about the society of the time, how plays were put on and so on. Um, Criticism's got this new empirical contextual basis, and Matt is very much sort of of this school. My problem with this is that I think this is a great movement, but I also think there are some limitations to it. Uh, and I'm going to use some specific examples from what Matt said, hopefully to illustrate that. So here's Matt talking about the idea of death in games. Let's look at the classic video game trope of lives. Why do you have a certain number of lives? Does that have any cultural significance? And also, why did it take so long for video games to embrace the idea that games didn't need to include the risk of death as a core mechanic in the game? Well, there's an actual answer to this, and the answer is boring. It's because games started out mostly as arcade machines, and buying lives was the most efficient way of getting people to keep putting money in to the machines. And once you know that, though, how do you feel about the importance of lives as a game mechanic? Something which was a beloved staple, something which was deemed to be a really important part of games for so many years, and it really only ever came about because of a faintly crass commercial interests. Okay, there we have a identification of a key gameplay trope or idea of death, and it's linked to a cultural context of arcade games. Um, I very much agree that the arcades basically um, fulfilled the idea of death as a mechanic, so they very much were about the idea of putting that to the forefront. It was very linked to the payment model, it was a big part of playing the game. But they didn't originate the idea of death in games. You could argue that Space War did that in 1962, for example, um, although you could probably trace the lineage back to earlier forms of gaming that weren't centred around computers. But if you look at Space War, it was a project that was created in a lab, it had no commercial basis. It was one of the very, very earliest sort of graphical games with controls and win-loss conditions and stuff, the, the, the same things that we recognise in modern games. And death was a big part of the game, it was a duelling game. So my argument here would be, I don't think death 
originated from the cultural context of arcade games. I think arcade games leveraged the existing human theme of death. That's not something that a cultural critic will like. And the problem is that psychology and neuroscience have really been kind of warring over the subjectivity of the human brain and, and the way it kind of develops culturally. The nature versus nurture debate effectively in modern sort of archaic terms. Um, whether our brains were adapted for a particular evolutionary purpose and they're set and that everything else is kind of built on top of that, or whether they're sort of relatively adaptive blank slates and we get all of our information from culture. As far as I can tell, and I'm not completely up on this, and I'm sure someone really knowledgeable could provide something interesting here, I don't think we know that yet. So when cultural context-based critics are saying that external factors originated these ideas and that there's only the only thing that exists is this cultural feedback loop that Matt illustrates, I think we should probably be questioning that. I think what's happening here is that people are using that worldview and they're imposing it onto everything, just as Matt says, nobody is immune from doing. I think that's a very good example of it happening there. So here is another example where Matt is talking about marketing. And the same thing is true of modern games. Marketing has largely defined our hobby and marketing just isn't effective if you target mixed groups. The result is a hobby that's largely defined by a group of men in suits. That's the only reason that most of the people who play games, well, in the past, were teenage men, and it's not a surprise that most of the products are marketed towards teenage men. That's just a reflection of how marketing best works. It's not a case of what makes the best games, it's just a case of what sells the best. Again, all valid points. Marketing is perpetuating these ideas of violence, it's playing on existing cultural ideas, but it, is it creating the desire for violence in, in play? I don't think it is. I think that goes back a really long way. If you look at animals, there's violence in play with animals who don't have culture. So to argue that marketing is in some way creating this, and that, to be fair to Matt, that's not precisely what he's doing, but this is kind of leaning in that direction. To say that it originates there is a very contentious point, and it's not something that we should take as a given. It's something that we should discuss and explore like we're doing now. My final point about this contextual stuff uh, goes back to the early part of Matt's video where he talks uh, very amusingly about Sonic the Hedgehog. All right, all right, so we'll call him Sonic instead of David, and the rings will just be something you collect. They won't be used as currency at all, but you'll require some of them in order to survive. You know, if you don't have any rings at all, you'll run the risk of dying. But apart from that, it doesn't really matter if you've only got a little bit of money or if you've got loads. Although, hang on, isn't that also a bit of a reflection on the relative futility of amassing large amounts of wealth? Well, probably not. No, but maybe. That's the thing. Maybe. Okay, so this has been chosen deliberately as a sort of slightly absurd example. It's something where it would be easy for a politics denier to come along and go, no, this is just a game, it's just fun, there's no message, there's no politics, it's all silly. And Matt very correctly refutes that. He's showing that there are some cultural influences, some grand ones, capitalism, and some kind of very specific 90s ones kind of creeping in there. My question really in this example, and this, this does have relevance to other sort of less absurd games as well, is, is it interesting? Is what it's saying about capitalism more interesting than what it's saying about other things? So Sonic the Hedgehog could be said to be talking about the idea of speed, fluidity of motion, control, the exhilaration of moving through an interesting space. And that's relationship, if you want to go contextual, you could talk about how it relates to Nintendo's slower paced, more cerebral games. With Zelda, they took a massive leap towards a kind of a uh, much more exploratory, slow game that was really alienating to consumers initially. In focus testing it was panned, it nearly didn't get made, and then now it's a classic. So that Sonic's relationship to those things, I think it has a lot more to say about those things than it does about politics and sort of socio-economic capitalist factors. That doesn't say, mean to say that it can't say anything about them, but it's the argument that isn't very sophisticated. Something that contextual critics miss, I think, is if you're looking at Shakespeare through the prism of a sort of 16th century historical artifact, maybe you're missing some of the great things about it. Maybe there are key things about love and revenge and other things that are embedded in it. Maybe the language is amazing, the jokes are interesting, although some of Shakespeare's jokes are terrible. But my point is that contextual criticism sometimes misses the heart of an issue, and it focuses on these peripheral kind of prosaic details and spends a lot of time talking about them. 
I think one of the reasons people get alienated by discussions of politics in games is that they're a bit forced and a bit tenuous because the games themselves aren't particularly preoccupied with those things. Now that doesn't mean that they have to be explicit. We don't have to be talking about you know, games that have a particular agenda that's consciously imposed by the author to, be, to say that criticism on a political basis might be overblown sometimes and it might not have the best evidential justification. So, again, to reiterate, Matt's video is fantastic. It is a really strong contribution to a wider conversation, which is something that I've been asking for. Um, and what I'd love to see is kind of more critical interaction around these issues and just a bit of an awareness that this modern school of contextual criticism might not be everything uh, and that there are some other things going on as well.